I'm a freelance illustrator. I've been working as a freelance illustrator for the past, it's coming up to nine years now. So I, when I was piecing this talk together, I was thinking about what do I talk about? How do I relate it back to the theme of restart? Don't really, you don't kind of realize how much you transition and change and kind of reset yourself in a career that's, you know, kind of like nine years long so far. And all the kind of steps you take and all the different paths and meanderings you kind of go down uh, with, with the work that you do, the people that you meet, and also the processes that you kind of start to use. And um, what I want to do is kind of highlight what I've been up to recently. Um, 2018 has been quite an interesting year. Off the back of 2017, um, I was feeling a little bit kind of like worn out and I decided, I think for 2018, I would like to travel a little bit more, get involved with more kind of community-based projects and obviously just develop my artwork a bit further. So luckily enough, I had some traveling planned with my mother. We went, spent three weeks in Hong Kong, Malaysia and Thailand. And traveling is amazing. Like if you have, if you can afford to do it, you know, just take step out of your studio, take your sketchbook, use your camera phone or get a camera and just take pictures. And it's surprising like how much um, you can benefit from stepping away from your desk for a good period of time. And Thailand was really interesting for me, like visually, it's just like rich in lots of kind of like culture. A lot of my work is based on like characters and such. And so I started to develop th these new ideas whilst I was there. And I think from here on in, like a lot of my sketchbook is just filled with like all these like great drawings that I just kind of had fun doing. Uh, I also decided to set up uh, a project called the Doodle Club. And the Doodle Club was just a simple premise. I'm not someone who plans that far ahead for things. I don't meticulously plan. I'm kind of anti-planning too much because like even today's talk, I've loosely revised it, but I don't really have notes and everything. I'm just kind of going off on the slides. i will quite, quite ad hoc in that way. But Doodle Club basically is just an, an evening of drinking and drawing where I invite artists, designers, and people that aren't artists and designers to come and drink and draw. We all sit in the same space, so everyone is equal. And we leave prompt sheets, task sheets, and the prompt sheets will have questions that like, ask you, can you doodle something that made you smile yesterday? Can you doodle something that'll, that excites you about next year? All of these kinds of questions that people can kind of respond to. And there are some fun prompts. Can you doodle someone on the table who you don't know and give them the doodle, you know, to kind of open up a dialogue? And so with these nights, like the, on the first night, about 110 people turned up to the bar, which was incredible. And there's a small like ticket price of, you know, to kind of cover the cost of pens and paper, but I'm doing it not for profit. I just kind of want to see how people respond to it. And I've been running them for the past year with help of some great volunteers uh, from Sheffield Hallam and other, other areas as well. And as you can see, like, there's a very nice atmosphere and a really good kind of crowd. Like we even have this little dude called Henry, who's the son of one of my friends, and he is just amazing. He, he's a future illustrator. I'm pegging him to be like someone really really good uh, also earlier in the year i was invited over to e3 now e3 is like the electronic expo which where they display um uh, new video games that are coming out for the year that meant i got to fly out to los angeles for this event and why did i get to, why did i go to e3 i was doing some work for a well-known video games in, uh, video games like internet website review website called GameSpot. I got to just design their stand and they spend millions on these stands, like loads of money on these stands. And um, they just asked me to kind of create some graphics that are loosely based on the characters, loosely based on that kind of video game culture. And yeah, they flew me over and I was able to like visit and uh, meet my heroes like Sonic the Hedgehog, which is great. <laughs> so you can kind of see that like, like I'm pretty chuffed that I got to fly over to LA. Uh, it's, it's my second time visiting there. I have friends over there anyway, but it's great to kind of go in that capacity where your, your work is your lifestyle and then your lifestyle kind of gets, allows you to like visit these places and meet all these different people. But as you can see, um, a lot of work here is quite typical of what I've been up to recently. Very colorful illustrations, character base, and you know, nothing too serious. To coincide my visit to Los Angeles for E3, I was invited by the Walt Disney Animation Studio to create a mural in their technology department 
basically, that's where they create films like Moana, Frozen, all of the, the 3D digital rendered films. But it's the same animation studio where they'd made Sleeping Beauty, Bambi, Aladdin, all these things. So you can only imagine the people that I met there. You can only imagine what it was like being able to visit the archives and not being able to take any pictures because I had to sign NDAs up to here and you know just not talk about it. But I got to see some incredible things, like original maquettes and models of like the Beast from Beauty and the Beast that they would give to artists to kind of help reference you know, as they're drawing and animating and all that kind of thing. What was really incredible about this commission was that they couldn't find anyone in the building to like doodle on this wall, even though <laughs> out of 900 staff members, 600 of them are artists, animators, designers, no one wanted to do it because they're too, they're, there's like an interesting culture of imposter syndrome there. Like no one who works there believes, oh yeah, I'm great, I, I deserve to be here. Everyone's like, I'm scum, I shouldn't really be here. So how do you think I felt? When, they, when I got to visit and they say, this is your wall. And they did warn me about how big the wall would be. 30 meters, 30 meters in length. And I only had five days to do it as the budget would allow. And so how do you plan for a 30 meter wall space? Quite hard because along, along the way, you're gonna meet people that give you ideas and such uh, to add onto the wall. But they just gave me free license to create my own characters and put them alongside their characters drawn in my style and as I go along they just give me um, recommendations and kind of oh, you include this logo in here and then they loads of easter eggs were hidden in this mural which is great my favorite one was four people came up to me and said could you draw a sasquatch in there and I was like great yeah what's the sasquatch what's that all about and it's like Oh, there's a guy who works at the end cubicle and he's got like really hairy arms. You'll, you'll see, he'll come, he'll come over in a bit. And when I saw this guy, I was like, wow, yeah. So people are like kind of poking fun at each other in a very nice, innocent way. So it was really fun to work on that. I also got to, I was invited to host a Doodle Club lunchtime event as well whilst I was there. So I had artists, animators, programmers, all these people kind of drawing to my instruction, which was really, really odd. It's... Um, it was just, it was a really, really good experience. And I kind of felt like it, it, things had gone full circle because I'd watched Disney movies and a lot of the, the Disney movies that I watched kind of must have fed into the work that I do. But to be invited back to the source of all of that, to kind of give them my artwork was like a really nice cylindrical kind of, um, just, it was like a really nice nod. So I was very happy about that. Also this year earlier, I did some work for Facebook. This will be the sixth mural that I've done. Uh, for Facebook across their various offices. And this one is at their new Rathbone place. This is a more recent uh, mural. And I've realized that my style is starting to tighten, tighten up a lot more. So still lots of fun little characters, but every character is kind of a reference to someone who's in the office at the time or things that I hear. Because you, I always ask to kind of create the murals during office hours so people can interact with me and talk to me, but also I can listen in on conversations. And some of the things are interesting, they're work related. I don't try and like spy or anything like that, but they might say one little thing that I kind of think, I'll put that in there. And then maybe two minutes later, someone will be like, did you just listen to our conversation? I was like, no, no, it must have just subconsciously just ended up on the wall. And they don't mind. The beauty of these kinds of projects in a way is that I'm allowed to kind of do anything with them because they're not so, they're not tied in with like too much branding and marketing because they're, they're only situated inside the offices. So you won't really see these unless I show them you or they post it. So in a way they're kind of private commissions more or less. Uh, I was also in New York earlier this year for a bit of a holiday, but I'm also represented by an agency out there who get me some interesting projects and work. And in a week I, I managed to uh, you know, wrangle a job with Kiehl's, um, quite a, a long-standing uh, dermatologist. And they invited me into their office, literally maybe six hours before I was gonna fly back to the UK to draw a mural. So I managed to nail this mural in about three to four hours, I think. Yeah. And that's and when I kind of started, like the time lapse starts halfway through the start of the drawing. And, and the guy was like, oh, I didn't know you were gonna work this fast. And, Sometimes I turn around like, I didn't either, but it's because if you've been drawing for like nine years on walls, you get faster, you get better, you get tighter. You don't think about it, but 
you kind of think about it, but you don't worry about it. You don't kind of stress out about it. And the planning stages, well, you know, I kind of did a sketch on Subway and showed it to them on the day and they said, yeah, that's great, brilliant, I'll just get started. I mean, my flight is like later tonight, so I need to nail this. So that bit of added pressure helped a lot, actually. So that was quite good. But yeah, as you can see, I just wanted to kind of focus on the main mascot character of Mr. Bones. I just really liked the idea of drawing a skeleton, wearing a bow tie, kind of, you know, having these like objects that, um, that kind of float from his palms. There's sometimes you kind of like latch onto an idea and that idea can just really piece together the, the, the final outcome. But yeah, again, as you can see, like the, the style of mural is like really tightening up because I think I'm always quite analytical about my work and sometimes I'm really embarrassed to show like really, really older like murals where it's just a lot of line work and there's no color fill. And a lot of people say, oh, how come you don't really add color? And my cop out answer is because when you look at it, you kind of almost imagine the color and you want color. And so therefore you're subconsciously coloring it yourself. That's always my cop out answer. <laughs> but really sometimes it comes down to time restraints and when I work, I work with a flow. If I'm going to color something, I have to plan it ahead, which sometimes I do now, but it's, there's nothing more annoying than doing all the line artwork and then trying to color in between the lines and going over the line artwork again. It just slows the job down. Everything about my mural process is about speed and the speed equals flow and the flow, you just get this like nice line that at least that as I'm drawing it, I'm enjoying it. But if I'm meticulously trying to like, fit these little bits in, it's like such a hassle. And I kind of like do that and I'm like, I hate this. It's really, really annoying. And I don't know, I can't explain why I'm like that. I've also been doing, uh, so yes, yeah, so Penny mentioned that I do some part-time teaching here. So I've been getting involved in that again recently. And it's great actually, it really resets the way I look at how I go about my process and what I do. And you, you meet some incredible students along the way who make some great work. And it kind of reminds you like, I used to be like you, and, but you're way better than me <laughs> than when I was your age. And that's, and that's, that's the God honest truth, because I, I reflect back on my university experience. I didn't study here, I studied at Nottingham Trent. And I kind of go more, I kind of talk more about that later on uh, with the slides. But it, they kind of inspire me and they kind of really, to be surrounded by people that impress you, that always helps. It always, always helps. And more recently, I've been uh, over, overlooking, the, well, overlooking, I've been watching over the uh, life drawing workshops with the third year illustration students. And it's a great opportunity for them to kind of explore what style is. But then I don't, tr I try not to use the word style. I try to kind of like make it more about output, experimentation, and translation of what they see in front of them. As an illustrator, I don't believe if you do life drawing, it's, it's quite important to try and study the form and study the rules of how you kind of depict a person, depict muscle tone, all that kind of thing. But I also think you can take liberties and kind of explore these things in a different way. It's like I always use the same example of like The Simpsons. You may watch The Simpsons and then you may never question why they're yellow and they have four fingers because in that reality, as you watch it, it's accepted. And that's kind of like what illustrators do. They make worlds, they tell stories, they can do it to their own rules. And that's something that I think is like a really important thing for illustrators to kind of remember. Like no one, it's like if you're a child and you drew a picture of your, your dad or your mom, they don't tell you like, oh, that's, that's really rubbish. That looks nothing like me. To the child, to the adult as well, it's like, yeah, that's how they're depicting me. That's, how, that's not how they see it. That's just how they're translating it. And as an illustrator, as you get older, you start to learn about how you kind of use that visual language to tell your version of the story and show them your worlds. But I am kind of like just talking a lot more about what I've been doing recently. And I'm supposing you're probably wondering like, how, do I, how did I get here? I didn't just appear here one day and just start doodling on people's walls. So we'll kind of wind back a little bit and uh, just kind of like, I don't know how far back I'll go, but I, maybe I'll just stop around here. So we've got to start somewhere. That's why I always kind of like tell people when I'm working uh, with like students and when I'm working on like my own personal stuff, like where do I start? But obligatory cute picture of me as a baby at a time where I had no worries in the world, didn't think about student loans, didn't think about getting a wife, didn't think about getting a house, didn't think about any of that kind of stuff, a more innocent time. And I try and hold on to that kind of mindset. Let's just be a bit naive, 
when we approach this kind of stuff. But yeah, I was born in uh, 1984 in Huddersfield, and my parents were Moa Law, well, my parents, Moa Law and Cockfung Law, otherwise known as, they pick their English names, Hubert and Shirley. <laughs> yes. Always ask my dad, why Hubert? And he said, I just thought it was a very English name. Yeah, but your brother is Richard, Uncle Richard. <laughs> but yeah, and Shirley, because Shirley. Uh, my mum and dad are the, the, the epitome of, of, of grafters. They just grafted. And being brought up in a Chinese household is a very interesting uh, experience with me and my younger sister, Michelle. They, they used to work a lot and they traveled around the UK a lot before I was born, just working in various different takeaways. And then they settled in Huddersfield, had their own takeaway. Mum had me, my dad just worked and worked and worked. My mum also had to look after me for a few years and then we ended up moving to uh, Sheffield and they set up their own restaurant. Now, as a kid, my, uh, interestingly enough, um, I had breakfast with my mum yesterday and she always and she came out with, I always felt guilty that I always left you and your sister upstairs whilst we were working all the time. But I did tell her. The thing is though, I didn't end up really stunted because of that. Like I had my sister and we had pens and we had TV, we had cartoons. We didn't really have that many toys. My parents didn't really know how to buy toys. They were kind of like, oh, they couldn't really afford it because they just set up a business. But they loved watching cartoons as well. So they would buy these like Tom and Jerry cartoon videos and like all the Disney videos so we could watch them together which was really nice. But they, they took us on loads of trips. And um, I think my parents, they just kind of saw drawing for me as a distraction, but they never kind of encouraged me to do so. Only my teachers encouraged me to do so. But my parents never said a word about it. And as a kid, you kind of don't really think about it. You just kind of do what you think uh, the teachers are telling you to do, so you should do it. But a lot of my kind of childhood was brought up on uh, cartoons like Transformers. And then eventually my parents could afford to buy uh, like video games for me and my sister to play. And so video games were a great way to kind of transport myself into these different worlds. As well as watching cartoons, you're just, you're just transfixed. You're in there with these characters. And so I used to kind of like live with these characters. You draw them, you learn how to trace them with tracing paper. You do all that kind of stuff. And I think it's kind of like vital that you do it. Like some people are really good at copying things and they kind of go, oh, oh I can't draw anything from memory. It's because you don't know how to do it yet. You need to copy to store it in your memory. And so a lot of the things that I used to copy, they, they, they come through with my, in my work now. And later, later in my like teen years, I used to, I just love comic books as well, but I never really followed like Marvel or anything like that. I used to buy comic uh, comic books based on computer games like Sonic the Hedgehog and Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, all these kinds of games. And I always liked kind of telling these stories. As you can see, like these drawings are kind of scrappy, but they're unhindered by any kind of like, oh, you could improve this, you can improve that. So when you're kind of creatively unhindered, you just kind of go with the flow and you do it. And you know what? I'm sure all of us miss being being kids where nothing hindered us really you can just kind of create make your work without anyone kind of saying like why are you doing that what's the point whereas like if you try and make stuff now there always has to be some kind of reason behind it which kind of annoys me because you should just create to kind of um to kind of improve i always see uh working you know i always i always think about working in sketchbooks and, and things like that and painting as a, way, as a means of like, it's your training pitch. You never kind of tell a footballer like, oh, why are you staying behind after training, practicing free kicks again? That's really silly. It's like, no, because that's going to benefit me in the next game. I'll be able to whip in a free kick, AKA David Beckham. <laughs> you know, like no one ever complained about him doing extra training. So why can't you just kind of draw for the sake of it, paint for the sake of it and it not have a purpose? You know, just everything that you kind of make it, it kind of has um, a purpose in the end. So my art education, I ended up going to Chesterfield College and Nottingham Trent University. And this was kind of like not really a renaissance time for me at all. I was used to go, I was used to being the kid in school who could draw. And then all of a sudden I go to an art college and I'm surrounded by kids who can draw. And my sense of ego from going through like secondary school, being the kid who can draw anything, was kind of like slightly dented because I was like, oh, I'm not the only one. And I did feel slightly threatened by that, but I had to reset the way I saw myself and try and humble myself and kind of go, you know what? I can learn from these people. And, 
and a lot of the people that I met from college I'm still friends with now who, who are making incredible things. University, I ended up going to university where I studied graphic design. I didn't go down the illustration route because I told my parents, I want to be a graphic designer. Oh, that's a shame. We always wanted you to be a doctor or a lawyer, but I want to be a graphic designer. Okay, what do they do? They work in an agency, I think. You know, like, what do you know, like, when you're at that age? I think they work in agencies and they make, like, menus and logos and things. Like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, go and do that. And, you know, you go through university, and so I was trying to, like, rewrite what I was, which was you know, a doodler, a cartoonist, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and it just kind of was quite jarring. But I just focused more on the fact that I could uh, meet all of these people at university, listen to all different types of music. I really got into, like, like avant-garde hip-hop, like thinking man's hip-hop and all that kind of thing. Uh, I was involved in loads of, like, outside of uni uh, events, like, you know, live screen printing with, like, local clothing labels and bars, just doing, like, loads of interesting stuff, which I kind of felt, like, helped build my character, really. Because I was quite a shy person. I wasn't, really, I wasn't really someone who would go out to bars on my own and do this kind of stuff. And during this time, I was just like really diving into my interests. So I really got into like anime and a specific series like Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo from uh, a director called Shinshiro Watanabe. And these were kind of like, these were really good genre mashing uh, animations to watch because they kind of, they, they mashed up genres of music and visual aesthetic as well. And so a lot of my work kind of starts to like veer off into this kind of direction whilst I'm at university. So I start drawing like cool little cartoon characters and comic book characters of ninjas and all this kind of thing. My tutors are like, what the hell are you doing? Like, what are you making? What are you? And I'm like, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Help me. But really, they couldn't help me because I needed to like find out for myself. But the short end of the stick was I was trying to create work that pleased the tutors more than more than making work that I really believed in, which was my mistake. It was just something that I felt like I was chasing a grade. And I didn't realize that like, basically you can create something that, is, that says more about you rather than what, what you want it to, more than what you want it to kind of attract. And so my style was kind of like all over the place. I was like working in collage, digital collage, painting, trying to make like these crazy gnarly posters that had like rips in them and things. And, the, you know, like, I had some really good tutors at Nottingham Trent, and, and I think they were very patient with me, and I think they knew that I, could, I should just be someone who just goes and explores something outside of university, and then maybe just see where I go with it. Because, like I say, I never planned for anything. I had no end goal, and I kind of still don't. Um, the end goal being, I just, I'd rather just kind of see how things happen. But the, but the turning point was, in my... In, uh, I think it was in the start of third year, we had a visit from doodler and illustrator John Bergerman, who actually used to study at Nottingham Trent, and he studied fine art. But he's known for doing this kind of stuff. And as soon as he kind of mentioned in his lecture, oh, so I, I just come back from Berlin where I was paid to doodle on a wall in an office. I turned around to my friends like, this guy can do that. I want to do that. And they were like, why? I was like, I don't know. It just seems really, really cool. And his artwork is quite unhindered as well. Like it's based on loads of kind of like African forms and it has hints of Basquiat, a bit of like Keith Haring in and all that kind of stuff. And it was just something that clicked that, okay, I can relate to this. Whereas like all the other illustration styles I was looking at were kind of like editorial things for the Guardian. And, you know, and a lot of my work was quite silly, cartoony and just a bit more representative of me. Um, and so I could really relate to this. I was really into it. So graduate, decided not to move to London like everyone else. I just needed some time out. So I decided to go back to Sheffield and stay with my parents, work shifts in the restaurant, work in the pub. I had like three part-time jobs. And that was actually some of the best. That's like one of the most kind of like f uh, prolific times kind of in my life. So you kind of think like, sweet. You finish uni, all the shackles are off. I've got all this freedom, great. And then you kind of go, oh, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do for like the next 10 years? But I did kind of just stride around, just kind of like, you know what? I'm just gonna do my thing at the behest of my parents. They were like so worried about me. But, <laughs> but in between traveling to all my different uh, part-time jobs, 
notebooks and sketchbooks were like my kind of savior. I, I used to catch like buses that were like 40 minutes long to town to like work in a Greek cafe. So I like have this book, I'd get to the cafe maybe half an hour before, have a coffee and draw. My parents were really good in allowing me to draw in the restaurant and in the kitchen when it was quiet. So I had like these sketchbooks just filled with these drawings that all this stuff I couldn't even work with whilst I was at uni. And I have like big piles of these books now and I always flick through them. And there are always ideas in there that are kind of like time stamped almost like, oh, I might revisit that. And that's, that's the best thing about having a sketchbook. And then you kind of look at the older work that you did like eight years ago and kind of think, wow, wasn't that rubbish, but how far have I come so far? It's not too bad. It's not too bad to kind of reflect back on, on the stuff that you've done in the past. And during those like wilderness years, whilst I was working part time, uh, I reconnected with a lot of friends in Sheffield and we set up like an entrepreneurship where we were uh, teaching kids in like youth centers and in certain schools how to design a t-shirt and we would print it for them there and then. We bought using funding uh, from Gordon Brown's labor government. They were giving out loads of money to help set up social entrepreneurships. And so me and my good friend, Angakara, we decided let's teach kids how to like design a t-shirt and print it right in front of them and they can go away with a t-shirt and empower them and, you know, and make them feel like, yeah, you designed this. All, we had to, all you had to do was give us the design. So we spent a few years doing that and then we, we set up the Hansu Collective, which was a collective of artists, designers, dancers, musicians, writers, and we hosted like art shows. We got involved with live art where we used to go to like a bar uh, where they did a, uh, a live music night and then they would buy these MDF boards. I'd stand there and draw on these boards. People want to buy them. People ask me, where'd you get your t-shirt from? Oh, I made it. So you do all of this kind of stuff. You kind of, there's no aim, there was no end goal again, but we just did all of these things to see what would happen. And this is during the time, it was like 2009, like there was like the big market crash. Everyone's going recession this, recession that. And we were like, yeah, this is kind of bad, but let's just go and do this anyway and see what happens. And you know what? It was like a mindset. You just kind of do the thing. If it fails, great, you've learned something. And during this time, whilst I'm learning to kind of draw on these boards in front of drunk people that are asking you, why the hell are you doing this for? And putting up with their stupid asinine questions, you actually grow thick skin and you kind of go, you know what, if I make a mistake, it's totally fine. You can totally let go of that aspect of if I make a mistake, I'm gonna look like an idiot. No, you don't. And during that time, I'm getting involved with a lot more uh, kind of like, things in Sheffield, like live art events for like Halloween at the Crucible. And me and Anger partnered up with someone else to kind of open up a shop uh, on Division Street in Sheffield where we could sell these T-shirts and design bespoke T-shirts for people that would come in. This is like one of many of the designs that I came up with. We used to play around with different materials. We'd send some of these uh, designs off to direct to garment printers, which means it's like putting a T-shirt through an inkjet printer. But then we would kind of finish off with our own vinyl on top. So the big pink area here is like our own design where we like designed a vinyl that is like kind of heat pressed on top of the t-shirt to create this like texture. So we were like really into like experimenting with, uh, with t-shirts as a form of kind of like artwork basically. And t-shirts are in, in a cliche way, like the best entryway to kind of getting your work out there because people wear them in the summer and people always ask you, where's that t-shirt from? I'm meeting more people in Sheffield because we have a shop front so we have a base where people can come in, buy a t-shirt and kind of go, oh, you know what, I run this night. Or, oh, you know what, I'm involved in this and that. And uh, the first Tramlines Festival was really kind of reflective of the attitude back then where you had a bunch of people that ran bars in Sheffield that decided summer's coming up. We know how dead it is in the summer. I think this was before, like, yeah, summer's coming up. Summer's going to be really horrible because it's just quiet. What can we do? And Loads of people and the people that ran the bars and nights said, why don't we just kind of have a weekend where we all host gigs and people can kind of like do bar crawls from each and the next. The movement starts to grow and I think the Sheffield City Council got involved and said, you know what, we like this idea. What if we give you Devonshire Green and we can, you can do that. And there's some really funny behind the scenes stories, the tram lines that I don't think I'm at liberty to tell, but there was just kind of this like slight ad hocness to it. They'd even asked me to like design like flyers and posters for some of it, as well as other artists. So there was like a really nice communal feel to it. And during that time, I'm, once you kind of do that, you get asked to do all sorts of flyers and posters for bars and events. But I was also experimenting a lot with like digital art as well as like my kind of hand-drawn stuff, experimenting with painting, uh, watercolor, all that kind of thing. There wasn't really like a message or an end goal to my work other than I just wanted to express and see what I can make. And 
with that in mind, I was just kind of really enamored by process. And eventually, uh, with all of this kind of work, that I'm constantly posting online and constantly having, putting in shows and, and such. I was getting interesting commissions from agencies in London. Like this one, I was part of a, an exhibition for a new range of Converse, Converse shoes where we, we were all assigned a color. And we had to create artwork assigned to that. And as I kind of mentioned before, social media plays like a big role in how my kind of brand grew. I was using things like MySpace and then moved on to Facebook. This is before like the Instagram era. This is before like anyone knew how social media really worked. But I saw the value in sharing as much work as I could. Back then, if you remember Facebook, like back in 2007 or something, it was just all statuses. People would say, like, George Law is thinking about tea tonight, like that, like really like boring <laughs> things. So I, I mean, I'm guilty of that kind of stuff. I see, you know, I see like old posts that I, I have posted stuff like that. But I used to post images all the time. And, the, and Facebook at the time was kind of like, you know, people were like, oh yeah, this is great. And I built up a, a, a network then, uh, just through people sharing my, my pictures and images and things. But having a good kind of sense of how you market yourself on social media is quite important if you want to, to garner more work. And off the back of like good social media presence, I, had, I got work through Facebook and this was the first mural that I did, which was a 15 meter um, mural in the office at Brock Street. And then fast forward a few years later, I was approached by, well, I approached, sorry, uh, my first agents, uh, Snyder New York, because I was getting a lot of work in the UK, but I kind of wanted to like spread further afield and try and get work in the US. I don't have any feet on the ground in the US, so I approached some agents. And having like the, the Snyder ladies, Kat and Christina, they're like my aunties. They're so like, they're just not like agents that you wouldn't imagine that they were like these people that, you know, fight for your, they fight your corner and kind of like, you know, go going hard on the clients and go like, well, no, no, you owe this person this much money, that kind of thing. They're people that I can critique my work with. And it's, it's really, really good. Really, really good. And through the back off the back of working with Snyder, I've had some great commissions with uh, people like Google and the Washington Post and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting working with a higher, higher set of client, but also by working with bigger clients, like you can kind of give yourself a bit more cushion time to develop your own work. And so I've been using GIFs, uh, I've been developing GIFs as a means to kind of communicate my thoughts. Because I, I started to realize that a lot of my work doesn't really, sometimes to me, it doesn't really say much. It just reflects something, but it doesn't say a lot. So I have a lot of opinions on a lot of things. So maybe if I can find like, if I can try and discover my visual wit, like how do I translate the things that I think into moving image, the things that loop? Um, because I think after a while, like as you get older, you start to you start to realize I have all these opinions on things, but I don't know how to translate it into my work right now. If I'm if I'm talking about really hard edged issues and I use like cute characters to do so, I don't know what the language is like for that. And um, and in my spare time, I'm still exploring different kind of outputs. Uh, and exploring things that interest me, sportsmen, my favorite films. I, I have so much resource material that I kind of like, turn to. I use the resource material and then just try different outputs, different ways of drawing, different ways of painting, and just try and make interesting work. So off the back of all of that, uh, I was on a really good run. Um, but during that time, my dad was really, really ill uh, from 2011. He, we, we, at the age of like, I think it was like 61, we discovered that he had an early onset form of Alzheimer's, which kind of reset a lot of things in the family, but also the way that I started to see the work that I was making. I was getting all these minor victories and kind of going, yeah, I did this work for Google and so and so. But when something like this happens, you kind of think, oh, that stuff kind of doesn't really matter as much. And so you start to think a bit inward and it really changed the way I looked at commercial work that like the world still goes on around you, but this right now is like a very intense thing that's going on. I don't know if any of you have kind of had anyone uh, experience what it's like to have someone who's got Alzheimer's, but you slowly see them recede back into the past and then also they just start to lose their faculties a lot more which is really really sad to see and it started to make me so i had the time to kind of reflect with my dad and talk about all of these things and you start to realize all of this time where i thought like you and mom didn't like 
the stuff that I was doing. You always did. It's just typical Chinese parenting. They never tell you directly. And the funny thing is, like, when, we, when me and my mom were on the flight back from Hong Kong, she actually turned around to me and was like, you know, I've always been quite proud of the stuff that you've done. And I was like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> Don't ever tell me that ever again, please. But, like, it's nice. It comes from a great place. But um, I think with my dad, it's once you kind of, once you have like a, what's the word? It's like an anchor point in your life where you can always reflect back on, which really grounds you and makes you realize, I lost that job today. I lost that pitch. I didn't, I didn't get that pitch. Or so-and-so has got this job. I wish I had that. It's actually quite interesting for me to kind of reset the way I think and kind of go, you know what? It doesn't, that really, really doesn't matter. I use it. I use, I use my dad in a way to kind of like, remind myself that he was a grafter and he never complained about anything so why the hell should I complain about not getting a job or is some like up-and-coming students doing awesome work like why should I be jealous of that I should be applauding that and um, so yeah so like the way so, and like the way that I can approach my work now I kind of have this like absolute freedom to it because there is a purpose but yet the purpose I'm not tying myself to it's not like I have to make this work to change the world. I'd love to change the world, but I'm going to try and meander through that and go the scenic route and see if I can do that in that way. So that's a little nod to my dad there. But then, so basically, so when my dad passed away, it was, it was two days after Christmas, so that was pretty intense. So I had a whole year to kind of think about, I kind of want to do something that connects people together. So I had a whole year to mull on this idea, and then the Doodle Club idea came through. And that's why I created the Doodle Club. The Doodle Club was just a, a means for me to meet people, talk to people. And sometimes, like, if I'm being totally candid and honest, setting up the night and everything isn't very hard, but it can be a mental strain when you're, like, you're doing work, you're teaching, it's like, oh, I've got to set up Doodle Club later. And you're kind of going through the motions, like, okay, emailing everybody, right, cool, we're setting up at this time. You piece it together, then everyone starts coming in, everyone starts drinking, everyone starts drawing, and then you're like, oh, wow, this is, like, really, really good. It's really, really interesting. And it's allowed us to kind of do interesting things with the volunteers where we kind of, we've created prints to like sell, which actually we have some prints over there at the end that you can look at. If you'd like to buy them, you can. So yeah, so very quickly, some thoughts from the previous nine years of being a freelancer. You should just be patient. This is a long game. This, and I wish I kind of knew that like from the start that you're going to, you're going to have days where you hit creative blocks. You're going to have days where you kind of doubt yourself. But really, that's all part of the process. If you just don't allow it to kind of feed too much uh, negative energy into you, it is part of the process. Doubting yourself means questioning yourself. But if you question yourself, you have to come up with an answer eventually. And sometimes the best answer is to do. Also, being patient with clients, being patient with how you approach day-to-day -day admin and things there, there is a lot to there's a lot to kind of being a, a freelancer where you're gonna you're gonna have many battles but you're also gonna have quite a few minor victories as well and that's just kind of like the ebb and flow of what being a freelancer is like but you have to just keep going um because if you don't then do something else you'll end up doing something else which is totally fine but i think i always knew that being creative or just kind of drawing for a living was something i always wanted to do since i was a kid uh, you should pro bono, but it should be on your terms. Pro bono, pro, by doing pro bono work, you're obviously offering out your services to someone, but you should always kind of think about what is the thing I get back. And sometimes it's not always about money. Money is nice when you kind of need it, but if it's at a point where you are invested in the person that's asking you to do the job, or you know that there is a payoff at the end where uh, they're making they're going to produce your artwork into a product. That's, that's actually quite a good thing So like this was a pro bono job with true north. They, they, I think they spent most of their budget developing uh, the can and the and the actual ale but The reward I saw is that like, they're gonna give me cans of ale But plus my designs gonna be on a can which I can document and kind of go look at this It's all like you know look at this. It's, it's a physical thing So I kind of saw a lot of value in that and I kind of pro bono by just I, I give out my time to charity, uh, like charitable events and such, and um, an organization called Artworks were kind of organizing uh, an exhibition and auction where they gave us blank bowl bowling pins to kind of like customize. Again, like I couldn't say no to something like that because it's a fun object to draw. 
to draw on and I could document that as well and you know and it, it, it had a purpose like they were going to auction it and they could raise funds for their uh, for their charity I also donated something to uh, printed by us who are a great like social entrepreneurship who kind of like uh, they work with like screen printing but they kind of empower people to kind of create the artwork you know and it's and it's a worthwhile thing to do like I you know, didn't ask for money or anything like that because they were gonna give me some prints and I could take photographs of those prints and go, hey, look at this, it's great. Maybe it's a naive way for me to work. Like I just give out certain things, but to me, it's just something that I can draw. You know, it's, it's, not, always about, it's not always about money, but if you're pro bono, you should always kind of consider what is the reward. Like if you're making work that you don't like and you're doing it for free, then that's when it's really bad because it's not on your terms at all. But um, when you can afford to give away free stuff to potential clients and to people that like your work, because it travels a long way. Proudly enough, sometimes I can go into like the Steam Yard Cafe in Sheffield and see people on laptops and go, ah, oh, that's my sticker there. Or like on the notebook, oh, that's my sticker there. So it travels quite far. But what's really funny is that certain clients will kind of get in touch with me and go, oh, great, we'd like you to do this uh, job. And I always ask them like, oh, how'd you find my work? You sent us some stickers like four years ago and we've just been waiting for the right time to commission you and you kind of go four years ago that is a long game and more to the point it is a very very long game so i experiment with merch a lot and i've you know been making like pins and stickers but i also kind of give away as i said before i give away my time for interesting projects so i help some university projects on something called funk and doodle which is like a a music and live art night and you know they they worked with like a projection mapper and like did this kind of stuff on my work and i was like this is great let me document this that's just something that i can regurgitate and use on my website use on my social media and people, you know it, it offers out the potential of of um, you know what what i can do importantly enough something that I realized when I was at uni that, well, your work does speak for you. So if you're making work that doesn't represent you, then you're making something that's quite a mishmash of stuff. Your work should speak for you in ways where it reflects like your process, your interests, you know, and kind of like just your thoughts. So I, I kind of create a lot of work that's, that's quite free, ad hoc and, you know, kind of fun. And, and a lot of people kind of always kind of, they always kind of feed back and say, uh, the work just seems really kind of like light and fluffy and, and nice and sometimes I'm like that yeah sometimes I'm I'm pretty light and fluffy and nice and sometimes I'm not but but yeah uh, also if you kind of constantly experiment and try out new formats new colors and things it just shows that you're a very curious person and I kind of think your work speaks for you on many levels and in a lot of ways that's an important thing to remember when you're, when you're working on like your own personal branding and you're sending work out to potential clients that the first, the first thing that the client should think of or the art director should think of is, wow, I, I feel like I know this person or I can relate to this person with the work that they give me. And sometimes it's not the case. Um, I kind of like collaborating with a lot of people as well. And by, be, by kind of showing, by, by collaborating with people you can really extend how far your work can go. Like I couldn't have made this animation on my own, but it also kind of adds an extra breadth to what I can do. I can collaborate with people. I can work with another agency. I can work with animators. It's, it's, um, I think it's just like a really important thing to do because sometimes like illustration is a very solitary process. But I think my final bit of advice is you just have to be you. you don't create work to try and please other people. Try and please yourself first and work that way. That's kind of my, that's kind of the way I've always worked. I tried from since leaving university. I kind of feel that like, if you try and create work that pleases a certain crowd, you get found out quite quickly and you just end up making work that kind of plays to a trend and, you know, and trends just kind of like they come and go all the time, but this, this, the, the chase is more exciting, you know, finding the holy grail of like creating timeless work. And there's some, there's some kind of satisfaction to that kind of chase. But um, even if you kind of struggle post uni, like, uh, 
with, with I can't find a job, I can't find opportunities to, to make illustration work and do all this kind of stuff. It's fine. That's all part of the process. You have to find yourself. No one hits the ground. Not everyone hits the ground running straight away like I didn't. Like my process post uni was like a process of four years of floating around and going the scenic route. And I quite like the scenic route, you know? You could always like go from A to B, but you know, just kind of like, what's down that wood there and what's over that ridge there? It's, it's a little bit more interesting. And sometimes you just have to ignore all those kind of exterior things and just stay creative. If it's writing, drawing, uh, doodling notes and all that kind of thing. Keep good people around you as well. Make sure that like you keep in touch with interesting, uh, your friends that you made at uni or like creative friends who can like kind of further your, your, your ideas and process and give you crits on your work. That's the most important thing. Because like sometimes when you work solitary, you don't have that. You don't have someone to feed back off. So if you develop a network of people that you can always show work to. And I think that is me done. That was a lot longer than I expected. But yeah, that's, that's me done. Thank you for listening to me waffle. Great. And yeah, incidentally, if you want to follow me on like the socials, there you go.